time, but we're going to get it. We're going to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. What? Do you mind if I clip you? Sure. Go for it. Thank you very much. Hey, everyone. Uh, really excited to be here. This is an awesome Orbit event. Uh, huge kudos to all of the organizers that put all of this together. So thank you. Can I get a huge round of applause? Thank you. Um, great. So uh, unfortunately, I have to run very soon. So uh, we can keep it short and sweet so that you don't have to hear me blather forever. Uh, but any questions that I can, people are want to hear me route the question to somebody else or me answer? What Not everyone at once. What are you most excited for? Man, what am I most excited about in general, in <laughs> life? Uh, and uh, um, a lot of things. I think like all of the L2s. So all of the addition of FEM uh, and the scalability stuff that is coming is going to empower a whole bunch of L2 networks around Falcon. And that's going to be a super, super awesome thing. Um, bringing the hot storage tier to Falcon, that's something that I'm um, thinking a lot about. And yeah. And also awesome uh, DeFi success in the last year. It's been great. Hi, I'm Mike. Uh, so my question is, uh, what do you think uh, uh, would happen if uh, Falcon is to lose the uh, majority of the uh, decentralized storage now through the uh, space? Right now it's a major player, but what happens if, let's say, other players join the market and Falcon starts decreasing the market shares? Um, so I think you're asking, like, hey, what happens in the network if um, SPs leave or whatever? So data has a large replication factor. So all data that parties store um, is meant to have a pretty large replication factor to um, ensure that there's no issue if individual SPs disappear. Um, and so there's usually some um, trade-off between the amount of payload data that you can have and the actual capacity that you have. Uh, the good news there is that we have a ton of capacity relative to the, to the use. Um, we have exabytes of capacity. And even though we've, the entire network is trying to onboard data as fast as possible, um, we're like far from filling that just because of how quick the build out in hardware was and how little Web3 is so far, right? Web3 is still very small. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't, yeah, I'm not, not very worried about that. Uh, plus, there's a, all kinds of incentive structures there of, around collaterals that uh, orient SPs to stay in the network. Um, so even, for example, if a particular SP group, if like the um, the actual operator, person, or company wants to like go do something else, it's way more profitable for them to sell the SP operation to another SP than to just like turn it off or whatever. So what ends up happening is people just like transfer that to somebody else. Yeah, so we haven't seen like, you know, incidents like that are worrisome or anything like that. Yep. In terms of adoption, in terms of adoption especially when you want to go large scale, beyond Web3 to get, gather the big enterprise businesses. We've seen that they're not the biggest fan of public data, right? They always ask me, like, hey, if you're going to put it on IPFS, all our sensitive client data is going to be public. We don't want that. Are, is, are there plans to bring privatized containers, any sort of environments? Yeah, so, those um, so first, you can encrypt the data. And so then, you know, it's kind of others can't read it. Second, um, this is not live in all clients now. But people are working on access controls for SPs so that you only retrieve the data if you have the correct access key, in a sense. And that gives you exactly the same kind of guarantees that in traditional cloud scenarios. Um, uh, there's some protocols that some of us have been thinking about to like, increase that, to create a, a way of like, staking against um, not leaking your data, um, where you know, there's kind of like a, a, a neat way of producing a protocol that, that does that. So you could do things like that. Um, and in the long term, um, I think for like the very sensitive data, we'll just FHE encrypt everything. Um, you know, that, you know, 20 years out, like that's kind of what humanity will probably do. Uh, uh, just to add on to this, are there anything for on the hardware level that can be implemented to make this happen? Because if you can encrypt, you can always find ways to decrypt. Yeah, yeah. So you can totally use things like secure enclaves and SGX and so on for all these kind of settings. But um, I don't know. I'd rather trust cryptography than trust that some hardware isn't owned. Like, um, I'm not kind of like an anti SGX TE like um, zealot or whatever. But I, so far, we haven't found TEs that like don't eventually get broken. 
And so once we have like a, a T that survives like 10 years, then I might be like, okay, great, let's, let's trust it. Um, also, we need kind of a much more open source TE environment with many other parties. Like, th there's are too few companies building TEs, and we need like a more like diverse corporate setting there, so that you have a lot more manufacturers. Um, but I think it like I think those things can work. Um, the other thing I would add is um, to your claim about like there's tons of companies that do do want their data to be distributed and shared in large scale open networks, um, especially massive scale scientific data sets. So universities and like the biggest data producer, um, which is like CERN, like there's an experiment in CERN called um, Atlas that is using Filecoin um, to store like tons of petabytes of data. Um, and that's like, you know, an example of like, you know, the biggest data producer in the planet is like happy with it, right? So yeah, that's a pretty good place to be. Yeah. Hi, uh, so uh, thanks a lot for the presentations over here, great learnings. Um, I work for a project called Filenger, which basically builds on Filecoin and build a data access layer on top of it. And we are looking very much into farming use cases. We talk about deepen, right? Reapen, yep. in the sense of owning actually the agriculture and the machinery and basically your food supply. So was, uh, we just like... Uh, Wait, Reapen is like regenerative physical infrastructure networks? I, I heard it, I heard it, like after Deepin, Reapen, yeah. That's great, I love it. I mean, uh, yeah, I was wondering what you're doing in this direction. Like, weather data is still, like very essential, right? For, like, yeah, uh, weather XM uh, is is storing all the data and and all that stuff. Got you. Well, I was wondering if there's a farming specific project that you'd like to uh, yeah, um, support. A here. Farming specific project. Uh, I don't know a farming specific project. I know one. I know weather XM is doing weather in a bunch of places, um, and they are thinking about agriculture uses. I know Spexy is doing a lot of mapping of specific regions. Um, but yeah. Yeah, go for it. Uh, thank you so much, Juan, uh, for answering some questions. Over the past 10 years, a lot has happened with Protocol Labs, Filecoin. My question is, what are you most proud of from this time, if you professional or personal? Wow, um, that is a very deep question. And there's like no way to answer that in a way that like somebody's going to be unha not unhappy. Uh, <laughs> um, I think probably the thing I'm most proud of is that throughout a, a ton of these projects and companies and groups, um, like, you know, kind of on the order of like tens of thousands of people are now kind of like working on a whole range of, of advancements. And so, I don't know, like the work that a lot of us have done over the last 10 years have kicked off like tons of improvements on a super wide area of of tech development and product development and just kind of like improving the world. And that's just like, if you think of it as like kind of like a ripple in history of like all of the work that we are doing accumulating, it's just like super crazy awesome. So yeah, that's really it. Kudos to everyone. Yeah. Following up on Robert's question, uh, given how much things have grown and kind of seems to be accelerating, what's the most What's been the most surprising use case of Falcon that you've seen so far? Surprising. Um, I didn't expect to see uh, all the tests in, in space so soon. That's super cool and super surprising. Um, I thought that was going to take longer, like a lot longer. Um, it's more IPFS, I guess, but um, yeah, I don't know. That one, that one is pretty surprising. Um, yeah. Can you maybe just talk a bit about like how you see the intersect? We've been getting at the, at the Filecoin booth the last few days. We've been getting lots of questions about like the intersection of Filecoin and AI and generative AI and all yeah. the new data being created and like what role Filecoin plays. Uh, so we'd love to get riff on that a little bit. Uh, and also, why did you decide to grow your hair out long time? Great question. <laughs> that, that, good. That's the good, good. That's, that's a, yeah. Um, so a few years ago, uh, well, so um, a part of the, we've always wanted to amass a large scale computational platform. So Falcon is like one piece of like the broader puzzle, right? In terms of cloud computing and so on and kind of making a decentralized cloud. And the port that we have um, 
kind of gave us the benefit of amassing a lot of GPUs as well. And kind of like in 2018, 2019, when we were picking it, we're like, you know, it's like probably fine to do this expensive computation because at the very least, it's going to help amass a ton of GPUs in the Falcon network, and that'll be really useful for compute. And kind of like in the last two, three years, um, we've been supporting a lot of groups in building compute over data networks to be building as L2s on Falcon to be able to like um, issue a lot of the computation jobs and so on. And AI compute is like one one part of that. So like AI compute is like one piece of the compute over data kind of large picture. Um, and so we've been also supporting a lot of groups building AI compute clusters and so on 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 Falcon. Um, and so think of like the Falcon network as a great place for people to bring their ML workloads because you already have massive amount of GPUs. The SPs, of course, want to make more money on top of whatever they're making. And you can store the data there and whatever outputs you have right there. And um, do you remember that uh, data has gravity? Data is pretty large and expensive to move. And so once you're like have it in one place and you keep computing on it and generating more and more and more, it just kind of like accretes to Filecoin, right? So um, the Filecoin network, uh, you know, as long as we can kind of kind of bring a lot of the valuable data and onboarding it into the network and start computing on it, that'll just kind of like kick off this like run of um, equilibrium to just keep a lot of the, um, the networks together. Um, and one of the key properties there is to really make it a, a very good economic ground for all of the innovation, right? So it should be like lots of teams building all of these different computational platforms and winning in various different use cases. And that should be like a, like a really good kind of um, outcome for, for all of those groups on the network and, and so on. Um, I do think, you know, specifically to AI um, projects, um, A, they're like way harder than anyone thinks they are. Um, I see a lot of teams that are trying to do it that like are just greatly underestimating how hard it is. B, it requires very tuned hardware setups, especially like the super high performance training stuff. Inference is a lot easier. So, you know, you can definitely do inference networks in a much easier uh, level. C, you have to be like, you have to lean into the benefits of crypto, which is provenance. And so we're right now lacking really good frameworks for provenance of ML, except there's like one that I know about that's currently not publicly, um, hasn't publicly launched it yet, I think. Maybe it is public. I don't know. Anyway, there's like really cool provenance stuff coming to um, um, Filecoin and IPFS and so on. And once those appear, then we'll have like much better ways of um, running computational jobs uh, for AI in, in these networks. Uh, I would just like caution people to be careful in building good AI use cases with decentralized networks because decentralized networks are a lot harder to, to um, restrict the use of. And so I think we need to get right all the governance framework of like who gets to run what compute things before we deploy super powerful models um, because that's pretty dangerous. So models are, the, the, the smarter and smarter models get, the more dangerous they are and the more misused you can see with them. And so we need to get like pretty good and robust governance structures on top of that computation before we can like just allow like anybody to just issue a little bit of, of money um, for it. So yeah, that's kind of like my perspective on that. You can, you can very easily do a lot of damage by you know, having some rogue op optimizers trying to like maximize crypto revenue in a wallet or something like that. Um, you know, the current LLMs could like manipulate millions of people, um, which would suck. Um, so yeah, anyway, uh, the important question, why did I grow my hair out? Uh, I don't know, I just stopped cut cutting it one day and like uh, I just let it grow out uh, for a while. I don't think I had a good reason, but yeah. Then I kind of liked it, and then I was like, okay, cool. I'll just wear it. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, like the re I should have grown it out a lot earlier, so a lot of the Falcon devs in 2018, 2019, when we were taking way too long to ship Falcon, um, stopped cutting their hair, and we're like, we're not going to cut our hair until like Falcon ships. This is why Nicola has long hair. Um, he ended up like not even cutting it. This is why Jeremy has long hair. Uh, a lot of people have long hair because of that. Um, I should have joined them then. When will we get Bold Juan? Bold Juan? I don't know. Good question. I'll, I'll call you. <laughs> uh, there are people very worried about that prospect. Uh, any last question? Yeah? Is there a project that you are surprised you haven't seen? Like a use case for Falcon you haven't seen? 
Uh, yeah, totally. Um, I mean, I think like the computer of our data networks, I would have hoped we were further along by now. I think they're fairly hard to build, but like, I, I think we could have gone further. Um, games. I think like there's a lot of use cases for games. Pretty excited to see that uh, grow over time. Um, we are seeing a lot of scientific data sets come online, but we because we don't have the computer of our data networks, we can do what I really want, which is like a massive scale scientific computing cloud where scientists can now like pretty easily and pretty cheaply do like all their ETL and like you know experiments and so on. So that's what I you know kind of want to see. Yeah. Cool. Thanks awesome. everyone. Great to see you. Uh, keep hacking. <laughs>